Everybody knows hot dogs are little sausages served in buns. <laughs> They're one of the great American foods. Everybody loves a hot dog, a good hot dog. So I can even eat them for breakfast. <laughs> it's an American tradition. You get them at ballpark. Hey, hot dogs! You can just grab them and just go. You can eat with your hands, you know, you can get messy. There's no rules to the game, you know, it's like, ah, rah, rah. <laughs> One of the best things about hot dog shops is they've not become standardized and franchised across the country. They're still small and regional and unique. So get ready. We're going to check out a few from Macon, Georgia, to Chicago, Illinois, to Anchorage, Alaska. We'll sample dogs topped with all kinds of stuff. I myself, I like it just like this, naked. They're good, they're good. You can't beat the chili dog. Sauerkraut or just mustard? Ketchup. Ketchup. I think most Americans grew up on hot dogs. Eat an uh, apple a day, I mean, it should be a hot dog a day. I think a hot dog is best enjoyed alone. Look how good it look. 41 years ago. What do you have? <laughs> We're going to celebrate hot dogs and the people who love them, even though some folks have slight reservations. Nobody can identify anything they put in these things. I wouldn't say they're bad for people. I would say everything in moderation. Upton Sinclair, the jungle, you know. Five days a week, that's fine. That's moderate. <laughs> Sin. <laughs> I'll take my chances. We're going to call this a hot dog program. And we apologize in advance if we don't get to your favorite stand. You know, you steam the bun, you steam the dog, and it's real soft, and it snaps with some chili. That's living. A hot dog program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Now, where do you get a good local hot dog? Let's say you're in Fairfield, Connecticut, where most mornings Gary Zamola parks this truck behind his father's lighting store. All its hand-painted signs, including the name Super Duper Weenie, were already on this 1973 GMC step van when Gary got it and fixed it up in the early 1990s. There are times when I drive in that thing and I could see people's lips inside their car and they're going, and I'll stick my head out and say, you know what? It's funny, but you said it. You, you know, how can you deny? I read your lips. I said, it's a great hot dog. How can you beat that? If the truck is in its regular spot, Gary's assistant, Mike Yancic, says you want to take exit 24 off I-95. People get off the highway right over there, and there's a truck facing them with a big hot dog on the side. And if they've been driving all day and they're hungry, it kind of sparks them. It gets their like, imagination going. They think about it and pull over they won't be disappointed. Gary studied at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, and takes pride in his two homemade relishes and his so-called killer dogs, with names like the New Yorker and the Chicagoan and the New Englander. It's kraut, bacon, caraway, the sweet relish. Th that's how the New Englander started. It was just your basic dog with the works. The dogs here are extraordinary. And the French fries are legendary. What do you want to add? Two French fries, one Let's iced see. tea, one, one dog. Everything's all like hand, hand cooked. Very good stuff. Very good stuff. And the fries are the best. They're awesome. I love my fries. You know, and a killer dog, and it looks like really good. I get off on it, and I get off on the feedback that I get. So good. My wife was in labor in the hospital with our second child, and left the hospital, come down to have a hot dog, and go back to the hospital and have the baby. This tiny little truck is serving hot dogs, what I consider four-star hot dogs. You go on your lunch break, you want to be relaxed. This is the, you know, it's nice to relax. I'm sure there's traffic going by, but... He's got a great hot dog stand personality. Oh, he's, he's a uh, great chef, not because he's my brother, oh, but he's, he's very good at what he does. Gary will do just about anything for his customers, but there is one thing he won't sell. So many people come up to that truck and they'll order the whole damn thing. The most loaded dogs you can get, New England or New, whatever they order. Order a fries, and then I hear diet soda and the hair on the back of my neck goes up. Diet soda is non-conducive to the times of the truck. The diet doesn't exist here. You are here to splurge, you're here to relax, enjoy. It's supposed to be like a, you know, 40s, 50s lunch wagon and diet soda didn't exist. Well, Gary's dream has always been to open a diner, a great diner with food prepared with all the love and conviction that he puts into his super-duper weenies. Passion is the key to this thing. 
If you don't dig what you're doing, you're dead. <laughs> I love this. I love working here, and I, I love the super duper weenie. And who could be happier, right? Most people are miserable at their jobs. So I dig it. I totally dig it. You know, a love of the crazy work involved really helps, even at a big hot dog stand, like in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Varsity. What do you have? What do you have? Put your money in your hand and you're all on your mind. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? The Varsity is an Atlanta landmark, founded in 1928 by the late Frank Gordy, who dropped out of nearby Georgia Tech. He made the Varsity famous for excellent hot dogs and unbeatable curb service. Big crowds on football weekends. You could go inside, but the Varsity was the world's largest drive-in. Ladies did not come in the Varsity. Don't ask me why, but it was called the Men's Club. And if you brought a date, you were outside, or if you were with your family, you had curb service. Nancy Sims, who is Frank Gordy's daughter, now owns and runs the place, where hot dogs with some southern variations are put together and sold at an incredible pace. The hot dog is just boiled. We have special design steamers to keep our buns nice and light and fluffy, but not soggy. You can get a dog here topped with specially made pimento cheese. And like most hot dog places in the south, the Varsity's got a superb slaw dog. This place's sales rate is phenomenal. It's around 17,000 hot dogs a day. Georgia, Georgia Tech football games, uh, big concerts, we can serve up to 50,000. And more Coke than any single location in the world. You can order at the counter or stay in your car because they've still got drive-in curb service. Either way, things move fast. And when you get to the front of the line, you better know what you want on your dog. How do I eat them? I eat them naked. I eat them yellow. I eat two when I get here. And I eat them chili cheese slaw. Two when I go on break and one when I go home. And I eat slaw. I eat them every way. I love them. They are so good. They are. I love a yellow dog for breakfast, though. That's good. Employees often stay here for decades, and the counter people all chant the signature what question. Do you have? What do you have? Anybody want to play some more? Hi, sir. What do you have? Some of the veteran cashiers are the best. Come on, let's go down so we can get early. Uh -oh. Down at one end of the 50-yard long counter, Irby Walker is in charge of the express line, and he often chants much of the menu. This is Irby. Sing, sing the menu for him, Irby. Sing the menu for him, Irby. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Have your money in hand all in your mind. Well, I can get you to the ball game on time. What kind of drink do you want? Well, we got cobalt orange, frozen orange, sweet milk, buttermilk, slid, bud, milk, pepper, blue, black and white, cobalt, stab, scroll, light and good, no beer. What do you have? What do you have? Have your money in your hand, your heart in your mind, where I can get you to the game on time. What do you have? Yeah, what do you have? 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 There's three words you got to learn. What do you have? What do you have? And just keep practicing over and over. It took me 10 years to get a job. <laughs> I went home every night saying, what do you have, what do you have? It doesn't matter what you have at the Varsity, when you've got a true counterculture and crazy cashiers, they make this big Atlanta hot dog stand unforgettable. And various factors can do that, including a little creative architecture. If you drive out of Denver, Colorado, toward the Pike National Forest, in Aspen Park, you have to stop at the Coney Island. We drive by it going back and forth, 285, and the uh, 20 foot hot dog's hard to miss. Yeah. Just rode by and saw the building and said, wow, let's stop in for a hot dog. <laughs> you gotta love a building that looks like a giant hot dog. It's 33 tons of concrete in the shape of an enormous wiener in a bun topped with mustard and a mountain of relish. It was moved here in 1968 from Denver. Karen Bott, whose mother owns the Coney Island, often works inside the giant weenie. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody come in with this look on their face, and then you can remember what it felt like when you first came in, the big hot dog. It just feels unique, like you're in some little fun house. The building is understandably long and narrow, and the perpetual line lets you know that the food must be good. Regular jumbo, long hot dogs. Had one, a jumbo. Excellent hot dog. Ketchup, mustard, relish onions. We have sauerkraut. Was a sauerkraut kind of a day. Our chips and hot dogs. 
chili, cheese. Mouth is watering, isn't it? <laughs> the taste good. I find everybody loves hot dogs that come in here. Even the vegetarians, I think, sometimes have a hard time resisting, or so it seems. The dogs are irresistible. The building is cool, and the name Coney Island conjures up hot dog history, which is not very well documented. We know the sausages came to America with immigrants, Frankfurters from Frankfurt, Wieners or Wienerwursts from Vienna. Now, it may have been at the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition that someone first put the sausage in a roll, although some say it was at the St. Louis Exposition of 1904. Still others say Franks were first put in buns on Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York, perhaps as early as the 1870s, by a seaside vendor named Charles Feltman. He later had a restaurant, and one of his employees, Nathan Handworker, quit in 1916 to open his own stand, Nathan's. By then, lots of folks called the sausages hot dogs, but where that term came from is uncertain, too. A newspaper cartoonist named Tad Dorgan helped make it part of the American language by putting hot dogs in his widely read cartoons in the early 1900s. Dorgan poked fun at a concessionaire named Harry Stevens, who often sold food at various arenas, including at the old polo grounds, where Stevens is sometimes credited with coining the term Red Hots. Who knows? There's just a long tradition of sausages sold by vendors at sporting events, especially baseball games. There would be no game if you didn't have hot dogs. You gotta have we hot have dogs. to give our tickets away. Baseball and hot dogs go together. In Cleveland, Ohio, at Jacobs Field on a hot June night, hot dogs! Hey, hot dogs! Jason Earnhardt sells hot dogs wrapped in foil. Tonight, I'll probably sell between 360 and 400 hot dogs. So it's a good night. Hey, hot dogs! Hot dogs! How many? Three, please. Here in Cleveland, you get local mustard with the dog. It's not good plain. It's better with that mustard. This is called Burtman's Ballpark. It's custom blended. It's very special. It's better than the regular yellow stuff. As I tell people, it's got a little Jewish mother in it. Pat Burtman Mazo now takes care of the mustard business that her father started back in the 1930s. And it used to be said, the Indians stink, but the mustard is great. Well, the Indians don't stink and the mustard's still the same, but the Indians have caught up with us. In fact, I think they may have surpassed us a little bit. Burtman's is a brown mustard with an award-winning taste. Everybody says, oh, it's got a wonderful taste of horseradish, but it has no horseradish in it. All I have to do is find the mustard and I'm in good shape. The thing about mustard is that it's a fun product. The ballpark mustard makes the hot dog. What do you think of when you think of mustard? I was enjoying this hot dog, and I missed Mark McGuire's home run. You think of hot dogs, you think of baseball games, amusement parks, fun. Hey, hot dogs! Yes, the hot dog business can be fun, but sometimes it's work. In the middle of the night in New York City, attorney Stephen Shaw is working on his website. He reviews local restaurants, fancy and not so fancy. I love hot dogs. <laughs> I think that they are, they are one of the ultimate foods. And I think that you can't explain its popularity any other way. You can't explain the popularity of sausages the world over than that they are activating more taste buds per square inch than, than almost any other kind of foods. Stephen suggested we walk to the corner of 86th and 3rd to Papaya King. This is beautiful, I give it four stars. It's very, it's very well balanced, it's very harmonious, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a temple of hot dogs. In some places, like here, the food is the decor, and the people. I mean, that's one of the things about any restaurant in New York, the people are the decor also. And uh, <laughs> you can't beat this crowd. Papaya King began in the 1930s as an open-air tropical fruit juice counter. A Greek immigrant named Constantine, or Gus Poulos, had stores in other parts of the country, but this one in Manhattan, in what was then a predominantly German neighborhood, may have been where Frankfurters came onto the menu around 1940. Gus's son, Peter Poulos, is the president of the company now. 
It was in 19, I believe, 1972 that my father decided to make a special frankfurter, our own blend that nobody could have. So the combo of the choir with the meat, the casing, the spices, the smoking, then we toast the roll, we have our own blend of mustard. So you put all these together and they make one hell of a good frankfurter. Well, whatever they do, it works. And for a buck 25, you get an all beef dog that delights even a highly discriminating palate. The pacing offers just the right amount of resistance. You gotta kind of bite into it a little bit and then bang, you're in there with the hot dog. It's a very, very good hot dog. And then you gotta cut that with a little papaya. It's a perfect combination. Still, papaya drink with hot dogs sounds weird to everybody but New Yorkers. But I guess that is the ultimate infusion cuisine, the hot dog with the papaya. Well, there are lots of places to get hot dogs in New York. Steven says the boiled dogs at the push carts aren't that good. My favorite hot dog is Gray's papaya. Uh, for two reasons. One, I think the hot dog is excellent, and everything about it, the hot dog, the bun, the, their choice of mustard, their sauerkraut, the temperature they keep their sauerkraut at, everything about it is just right. But also, the hot dogs are 50 cents. And I, I, can't, I can't get past that when evaluating the difference between Gray's papaya and all the competition. I mean, it's hard to all together. It's hard to I think the cost has a lot to do with it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, there's not very much you can get for 50 cents in New York, you know. Nicholas Gray started Gray's papaya in the early 1970s in imitation of Papaya King. He deals in volume. I sell about 11,000 a day between the two stores, just over 4 million a year. And they're just good here, I guess, because they've been cooking for a long time, and you can't beat a buck for lunch. Uh, I, I bring my dates here every now and then. They get a little upset, but hey, it's good hot dog. Sauerkraut makes the hot dog. I can't have it without. Ketchup and mustard strictly. Ketchup and sauerkraut is good. You have a good bun, too. Yeah. We go for everything, usually. Let's enjoy it. I really do. I'm a hot dog freak. I'm not an authority. But they're very good. Once in a while, I feel uh, inextricably drawn. It's almost a sinister. As soon as I gather enough money, I come back here and I get more hot dogs. Woo! Oh, a little hot. <laughs> Pretty good. Even so, for a good dog, many New Yorkers will still send you out to Coney Island, to the original Nathan's Famous. They sell 130 different foods now, even fresh clams. But Nathan's president, Wayne Norbitz, says get the original. Our hot dog is 100% all beef. There are no fillers. And this is a casing on this hot dog, a special sheepskin casing that gives it a certain crunch and snap when you bite it. You know, Nathan's opened in 1916, and I guess they really, you know, make a good wiener, so. Started from this corner right here. Right from this corner. With $600, now we forget about it. When I was little, we used to come here. It's five cents for a hot dog and five cents for a drink. Because uh, the food is, is uh, it's so authentic. It's uh, got that Nathan's flavor, that Coney Island flavor. And my husband tells me it's really not the best thing for me, but I don't care. <laughs> chili, um, uh, chili dog uh, is very good. And now I eat chili dog and cheese. Well, um, they do specialize in dogs, so it really tastes good. Well, this stand becomes the center of the universe on the 4th of July when Nathan sponsors the annual World Hot Dog Eating Championship. We come out here on the 4th of July and it's a way to demonstrate how much you love your country. It's a Nathan's tradition, now run by this clever PR man named George Shea. Competitive hot dog eating season, I don't know if you follow the sport, begins on Memorial Day, and it ends here in Brooklyn. I would like to see, by the year 2000, a spot in the Olympics. I would like to see us in Madison Square Garden. Well, in 1998, it was still on Stillwell Avenue on Coney Island. The crowd gathers early to see who will eat the most hot dogs in 12 minutes. It's like a free-form circus with protesters, too. Nathan's Go Veggie! Give peas a chance! The competitors are introduced just before noon. 
The whole thing is overblown, outrageous and silly. It's all American. Think about it. We're here on the 4th of July at high noon, 12 minutes. That's the patriotic epicenter of the year. Contestants each get a pile of hot dogs. They can add mustard, but savoring the sausage doesn't seem to be a priority. The man they're all trying to beat is the defending champ, Hirohumi Nakajima, a tiny 23-year-old from Japan where he's won numerous noodle-eating contests. And in the crowd, there are fans who know the superstars. I know the technique, too. It's all, it's quite slow. Do not chew. You separate the bun and the dog. You squish the air out of the bun. You go dog, bun, dog, bun. It looks like you need a lot of concentration. You don't, you don't need a big belly for this. The last five minutes is like, that's where dreams are made, realities are broken. American on the 4th of July so I should win the, the hot dog eating contest. I think it's appalling. The surprising thing is the small, smallest guy won this convention. He eats hot dogs only once a year when he comes here. And every at the contest. And this, I believe, is the best, biggest, and supreme stunt in America. I might be a competitor next year. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, but even on the 4th, New Yorkers have to face the fact that the world capital of hot dogs may be Chicago. I mean, Chicago, they try to claim everything. They're like deep dish pizza, like Pizza Hut didn't invent that. A New York hot dog is a limp little weenie. They got the windy city, like we don't have wind here. On a skinny little limp bun. Well, you know, Chicago, they put on everything. With some mustard. And actually, by the time you have to frank, you're not sure what you're eating and some kind of icky sauerkraut, that's it. There's no onion, there's no tomato, there's no relish, there's no hot peppers, there's no pickle, there's no celery salt, there's nothing there. But in Chicago, you get all that, usually on a boiled dog in a steamed bun. And you know, there are more independent hot dog places here than all the areas McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King's combined. Each place in Chicago is an original. They've got some very high concept of what they should be doing, and they do it. Rich Bowen and Dick Fay are professors of psychology at Loyola University. And back in 1983, they wrote a now legendary book titled Hot Dog Chicago. They said we should meet them first at Bill's Drive-In, near the border between Chicago and Evanston. Would this be the best hot dog place in the city? It's like saying, who's the best human being on the face of the earth? We're all, we're all great, right? The question is, what's, what makes each of us distinctive? And so it, this ranks right up there. The hot dog here stands shoulder to shoulder with any other hot dog in the universe. Bill's drive-in opened in 1949. The original Bill's son, who's also Bill, works occasionally, but he's retired. His daughter Robin and her husband, Rob Klitschko, run the place now. <laughs> they dress no dogs until they're ordered. Uh, how do you smell summer? Well, every order is a special order. We ask every customer that comes in what they want on it. It just seems like the perfect way to make a hot dog, right in front of the person. Yeah, okay. Well, this is a this is a classic Chicago hot dog with the beautiful um, red tomato. This one has uh, pickles on it, chopped onion, mustard. There should be some green relish in there somewhere. And then it's also got the hot sport peppers. In Chicago, adults love hot dogs, and they're made for adults. You know, spicy and full of adult tastes. Bill's Drive-In is a low-key sort of neighborhood place. Doesn't call a lot of attention to itself. Unlike the Chicago landmark known as Superdog. Superdog is on Milwaukee Avenue at the intersection with Devon and Nagel. It's the place with the two big wieners on top. They're not wieners. It says so on the menu. Not a wiener, not a Red Hot, and not a Frankfurter. They're Superdogs up there. If you'll clean up your language, we can continue. <laughs> okay. Those Superdogs on top of the building are known as Maury and Flory. 
named for the couple who has owned and operated this place since 1948. Maury Berman and his wife, Flo. I love hot dogs. I just love them. Every day, I eat a hot dog. And I think it has to do with the, with the spicy, seasoned uh, taste. Because I don't eat a hamburger every day. And I could. They do make some great burgers here called Whooper Cheesies, but it's the super dogs that have been the prime attraction since the beginning. Mustard, neon green relish, uh, ketchup being really an abomination. We, we will serve it, but we won't put it on. A slice of kosher pickle, a slice of pickled tomato, and serve with our own french fries. So it's an entire package. Their fun little boxes say stuff like, your super dog lounges inside, contentedly cushioned in super fries. And if you're lucky, the car hops will be on duty. Every customer who comes and presses the button for car hop service is greeted. Hiya, thanks for stopping. May I take your order now? Now that's standard. It's standard, but distinctive. One of those special touches that distinguish this place from all the other hot dog joints in Chicago. Each place has got to have a great sign or a funny name or a cool location, like Demon Dogs on West Fullerton that sits right under the elevated train tracks near DePaul University. Peter Chivarelli, who owns this place, serves relatively simply dressed dogs, but on weekends, he employs a man in a tuxedo. Make sure everyone gets a good seat by the window. Our early morning customers who come in on Saturday hung over can't remember where they saw this guy at, but you know, they see a, a, a guy with a tuxedo or some Mater D in a hot dog stand. I figured it's, it's kind of a thing to make them start out their day in a, in a good mood. Peter also manages the rock group Chicago, and he's decorated with rock stuff. Also, Rich Bowen, that hot dog psychologist, brought his kids who get their dogs with ketchup. Ketchup. This is like, a, there has to be something in the brain of the child that causes this phenomenon. Because as the child grows, at some point, I think in their teens, they finally bond with mustard. Like a switch goes off. Well, ketchup or mustard, in Chicago, it's easy to find one of the places called Portillo's. This one's in Downers Grove. It's a new building designed to look old and interesting. I don't want to get in your way here, Tom. Okay, all right, let me squeeze by here. How's the drive through Real well. That's Dick Portillo. He owns 20-some hot dog places. How you doing, sunshine? He began with one tiny shop, no running water, back in 63. Hi, lady. Hello, how, how are you doing? doing? I'm how good. You doing? How are you? Good. Make sure you contact right. I will, too. <laughs> now he has a huge hot dog empire. Is there some secret to all of this? It tastes good. It's simple. You're looking for this big explanation. It's... Uh, uh, there's good hot dogs and there's bad hot dogs. I mean, most of these people are repeat customers. If it didn't taste good, they wouldn't come back, would they? Well, at Portillo's, as at most Chicago stands, the dogs themselves are from a company called Vienna Beef, founded in 1893. Jane Lustig, one of Vienna Beef's vice presidents, offered to show us how they make wieners. We have a team of very skilled uh, butchers, and they trim the fat off of briskets, uh, which we use then inside our hot dogs. Um, our hot dogs are made from 100% domestic fresh bull meat and sweet brisket trimmings. And those ingredients will be ground, first like hamburger, then transported, seasoned, and ground again. Those machines, those weird flying saucer machines actually take the elements of our recipe and they grind it down to a fine puree. The puree is still raw and has to be put into some kind of casing to hold it together while it cooks. Even skinless wieners at this point get a casing, often brightly colored. Skinless hot dogs have a very uniform look. They're straight um, and they're exactly the same size, whereas a natural casing hot dog has irregularities in its shape and its curve. Natural casings are made from the linings of the intestines of a sheep. Sometimes they're hand measured and twisted into links. All the little raw sausages are eventually moved into huge ovens filled with hickory smoke until they're fully cooked. The natural casing wieners are ready to go, but the so-called skinless wieners have to have their fancy skins taken off. The skin is 
is removed with our hot dog skin removal machine. And it actually peels the hot dog from this, the plastic outer wrap and shoots it out like a bullet. It's kind of cool. It's totally cool. And you can talk these babies Chicago style. Or if you're ready to motor west, only as far as Springfield, Illinois, you can see a totally different kind of dog, a cozy dog, at the cozy drive-in on old Route 66. Buzz Waldmeyer has the kind of family-run place here that's good to find anywhere. Cheeseburger basket up. Buzz's father, Ed Waldmeyer, was one of the co-founders of the Cozy Dog House back in 1950. He had learned to make corn dogs in Texas while he was in the service. He made some improvements and started calling them Krusty Curs. When he brought the Krusty Curs back to Springfield, Illinois, uh, my mother didn't like that name, so she came up with the name Cozy Dog. It, it sounded a little bit more pleasant. And Cozy Dogs are what the Waldmeyers have been selling ever since. I would say 90% of my business is local people who've been coming here when they were little boys and girls. And Every time we come back to visit, this is where we come first. It's right. a corn dog. It's a corn dog. My no, mom you said it's a cozy dog. Here it's called a cozy dog. And I've been in town for less than a week, and I've been here four times already. I can just remember coming here when I was a little bitty kid and, you know, four or five years old. And... Because I want to tell you, this is the best. I just love these cozy dogs. People do develop affection for some of these sausages. And in Clifton, New Jersey, there's a definitely lovable hot dog place called Rutt's Hut. It's been a local landmark since the 1920s. We used to come here in our high school days quite often. The hot dogs are great. In the 50s, when I got my first car, this was the place to come with a date. My parents made out in the parking lot at Rutt's Hut. This used to be a makeout joint. And I thought it was quite different that everybody was here just kissing and hugging and... And then you make out in the parking lot afterwards. It was great. <laughs> and he got me introduced to hot dogs. And this place makes some unforgettable hot dogs. Deep fried hot dogs. Abe Rutt, the original owner, started to cook the dogs this way, but he sold the business in the 1970s to a new family. We're all related as uh, four, four families, actually. It's uh, the Caragiorgises, the Petropolakises, the Sacularises, and the Chrysophenises. The new Greek owners, including Gus Chrysophenis, usual kept all the original recipes and traditions, including calling out the orders to the kitchen and the fryer. Gus's sister, Calliope Chrysophenus, says the nicknames for the dogs here are just part of the Rutz Hut shtick. A lot of the customers that have been around forever, when they come in, they already know the lingo, so they order it that way. You don't come in here and order a hot dog. They give it to you raw if you order a hot dog. You gotta order a ripper or a cremator or a weller. When we first drop them in the oil and it first comes up, it's what is called the in and outer. And it's just, it's cooked, but it's very, like, almost rare. Most of them, after a while, they all become rippers because the hot oil makes them rip open like this. And last but not least is the cremator, which is cooked through and through, super well done. And this is the homemade relish that's very famous. It's a secret recipe. It's mustard and cabbage and carrots, and it's great. But there's no question, people come back here for the rippers, and it's never too soon to start. Customers just rant and rave. This is my third one. <laughs> I could keep going. So I had my grandfather's funeral some 10 years ago. They come off the plane, I have to have a Rutz Hot hot dog. If my wife knew I was here, she'd kill me right now. <laughs> you know they stopped here before the funeral got hot. <laughs> It's almost embarrassing to admit it, but we all joke about it at this point and laugh Grandpa about it. Grandpa would have wanted it that <laughs> way. Grandpa would have wanted it that way. <laughs> of course. Rutz Hut is obviously a beloved place in Clifton, and that's not unusual, even in a big city like Los Angeles. Richard Pink and his wife Gloria help run the place called Pink's at the corner of Melrose and La Brea in Hollywood. Richard's sister, Beverly Wolf, also helps carry on the Frankfurter traditions established by their parents back in 1939, when Pink started as a push cart. And, you know, they had hot dogs there for, I think it was 10 cents, and Cokes for a nickel, and people would drive up in front. And uh, that's pretty much how it got started. The secret is that the food tastes great, 
and it really is delicious. And also, there's a sense of history here. In Los Angeles, anything over 10 years is, you know, major news. The counter here opens right onto the sidewalk, and Pink's has lots of hot dog possibilities. Well, the famous thing is the chili dog. Chili dog. <laughs> We got a 10-inch stretch dog. Or the jalapeno dog, you see the long 12-inch hot dog. And the Polish dog is meatier and very good, and I like it with the lettuce, sour cream, and guacamole. It sounds like it wouldn't taste good on a hot dog. It's delicious. You have to try that. <laughs> There's a nice patio out back where you can dine al fresco, but everywhere here is a place to be seen. People of some notoriety may show up at any time. We're, we're near about four different studios here. I used to do the Jeffersons. I'm an actor. I played the character Marcus. I worked in the cleaners. And a lot of struggling actors would come in, and they knew that directors and sometimes producers would come in here. So they started, like, hammering or tacking their own picture up on the wall. In fact, Matt LeBlanc said when he made it big, his dream was to have his picture on, up on the wall of fame at Pink's. When I was on the show, everybody used to tell me about Pink's. Do you know who holds the record for dogs? Orson Welles. And all my friends were here, so, you know, and we conducted business here. Guess, how many did he eat at one sitting? What I like is there's no commitment involved with a hot dog. 18 at one sitting, Orson Welles. Is that fabulous? And my dad would say, you know, Orson, you're going to get heavy if you eat all these hot dogs. Then guess what? We're standing here, and this is not a setup. Ruth Buzzy just pulled up in her car. Ruth, I love you. You want a dog? It's just, it's just a great place. There's nothing better than a hot dog and a, and a drink. You know, in the middle of the day, it's even if you're sneaking food, you know what I mean? It's, it's a good sneak food. The terrible thing is you think, nobody will see me. I'll go there at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and there's a crowd. Yeah, no matter when. No matter when you come here, there are people here. Well, obviously, it's people, not just celebrities, who make a hot dog place thrive. Sometimes an extra community service helps, too. Just north of L.A. in Van Nuys, California, there's a smart little hot dog stand with a legal theme. It's called Law Dogs. That's the usual stop on my day off. Oh, I get the, the police dog, the mustard and sauerkraut. Our popular dog is, you know, the judge dog, which is mustard, onions, and chili. And then you have um, our jury dog, which is the mustard, onions. People like that, too. Frank Caviani is only 17. He wasn't born when this place was founded in the 70s by a lawyer who named the different dogs and who started the special service that people line up for on Wednesday nights. That's our legal advice night. We have a lawyer who comes in, and we, we have a lot of people come in for seeking advice, and it's a free consultation. I have about two-thirds of my clients uh, Spanish-speaking and one-third are English-speaking. Rich people, poor people, all kinds of walks of life but really are aimed at those people who cannot afford legal advice. Jesus Perez is a lawyer and part-time judge who, since the early 1990s, has been helping all kinds of people in the back of law dogs. Uh, you have people who sue for uh, a dog bite, uh, who sue for back rent, people who don't want to pay rent. I've stopped in a few times and had the hot dogs, but never had a need for the advice. Now I need the advice. I prefer what he would tell me than looking in the yellow pages because he shows me the right kind of community spirit. People feel secure there. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Okay, thank you. What brings you here today? Confidentiality rules apply, as if he were paying me. Given that his, his free time for something as American as his hot dogs, you know, and he's in the, the legal system, I said he's got to be all right. Sometimes people laugh and so people, people cry, yeah, but uh, they all get the answer. Somehow or another, I give him the answer. Okay, for Wednesday, nice meeting you, nice meeting you. Pleasure. Heard someone say it's the American way, you know? It's like <laughs> hot dogs and the, the Constitution, you know? It's like, it has a good fit. Hot dogs fit all sorts of situations. And hot dog stands can be comfortable and accommodating in ways that other restaurants just can't. In downtown Macon, Georgia, on Cotton Avenue, New Way Wieners has been a place to meet and eat since 1916. It's as old as Nathan's. Jim Andros is one of the four family partners who now own and run it. It's called New Way, but it's really old. It's the kind of place that doesn't change much, which you can always depend on and count on to be the same every time you come. Jim Cacavias is a cousin and a partner here. It's really a time machine. You come in here and you would think you're in the 1940s. But during the Depression, it was, uh, it was a mainstay because 
the chili dog all the way has kind of a way of staying with you throughout the day. <laughs> I've had hot dogs everywhere, up and down New York, Chicago, and a new way is a new way. I think it's a combination of chili and the actual hot dog itself. I get slow, sometimes I get ketchup and mustard all the way. It's a, like, a, like a real hot dog. Or uh, what the thing about it red? I don't know where to get them from. They red hot dogs. You can't get them from the stove. There is a there is a red dye. Government uh, number so and so, and it's very safe. And uh, it's uh, it's always been on there. The way things have always been is important here. In any culture you look at, bread wrapped around the meat is a basic issue. If, for instance, I'm Greek, so I know about Greece. You have the hero which is the round pita bread around with the stuff with meat and goodies on the inside. In America, it's the hot dog. And it tastes pretty good. I don't think anybody dislikes a hot dog, no matter where it comes from. Well, if you're down south doing the dog tour, you will want to head also for Anderson, South Carolina, where there's an out-of-the-way hot dog place called Skin Thrashers in an old textile mill village. If you go to business school, everybody talks about location, location, location. Huh? Well, this defines all business logic. It is off the beaten path. If you ask anybody in the city of Anderson, they can get you one. Skins Hot Dogs is a family business run by the two Thrasher brothers and their brother-in-law, Wayne Harbin. This place was a cafe and pool hall, according to Mike Thrasher. My dad started it in 1946, Skin Thrasher. Well, actually, his name's Lloyd Thrasher. Skin, who got his nickname after a boyhood haircut, started making hot dogs that everyone said were extraordinary. Some people say it's the buns because we just put them on top. Some people say it's the winnie. Skin used to say it was a combination of three things, you know, the chili, the bun, and a good weenie. You can get beer here too, limit two, but that's not the beverage they sell most of. The drink of choice here is Coca-Cola and a glass bottle, returnable bottle. Coke. Small Coke. Small cup. Small Coke. Always. The little bottles taste better, you know. <laughs> Five no mustard mayonnaise to go. Six all the way to go. Two chili dogs, no onion to go. And if we're both lawyers, sort of like a ritual, we come here at least once a month. Probably two or three times a week. I can't hardly stand a week without them. Why? Because they're good. They're easy, you know, they, you give them like that, five, you give them like five minutes, something fast. Texas Pete and a little salt. That's it. I probably eat some of the first ones he made. These are the best. They're so good. <laughs> if you'll get you one and try it, you'll see what I'm talking about. I hate them keep up my appearance. <laughs> well, how a hot dog looks and the style with which it's served are also important factors. Skins here is a bit unusual because they don't serve that most beautiful southern variation on the hot dog, the slaw dog. For a great slaw dog, you will want to head on to Columbia, South Carolina, where in the neighborhood called Five Points, you'll find Frank's Hot Dogs, owned and operated by the Barco family since the early 1970s. Nowadays, six days a week here, Stephen Barco grills and serves some extraordinary wieners. What I love about them is the uh, natural casing, the natural casing wiener. Uh, I like it a lot. It's just the best dog in town. I mean, there's some other good dogs. They got a funky chili too. It's not quite as. Uh, it's a little tougher. It's got a little snap to it. They got a crunch to them. They're tough, tough dogs. Kind of goes. It's even got a vegetable on top of it. You're set. Coleslaw. No, that's really yeah. a southern thing, I think. And it's a real treat, northerners to catch up. I get eat? a slaw dog, no onions. I like the onions, but I, I, I deal with the public. I don't know what, it must be the chili. <laughs> Whatever. If it's during the day around here, Stephen takes care of the business. How many, one? His father, Frank Barco, has retired. But four days a week, Frank moves a little trailer into a parking spot across the street where he sets up the late night Frank's hot dogs. Here he caters to cops, cab drivers, and college kids from the University of South Carolina who corrals around here. We have a few wild ones every once in a while, but, but uh, most of them are good. And well, one thing that I like about them is I feel like they're not as fattening as hamburgers. 
you know. I'm looking for the good stuff. You know, the good stuff like my mom cooks and Frank doesn't, man. I think I got my mom in the kitchen back there, you know what I mean? You just like to stand around with a hot dog that you're not eating? Can I have a bite? Sure. I usually just get ketchup and mustard because I don't want to like the onions, bad breath. Late at night? Oh, it's yeah. awesome when you've been drinking and you can come it's here. you up. <laughs> and then you might be able to drive you home. <laughs> my college years would not be significant if Frank were not a part of them. When we get ready to close late night, and all the bartenders and all, we, we call it the $5 bag. Anything we got left over, we fix them a $5 bag, about $8 worth of food for $5. It's good. I mean, my father and my family has made a decent living by selling hot dogs, whether it be 10 o'clock in the morning or two in the morning. This is getting bigger and bigger all the time. I tell you, uh, my business is growing all the time. That's pretty damn good. <laughs> Hot dogs and good times work well together. And you can bet that sometimes size does matter. In Las Vegas, on the Strip, there's a very small casino called Slots of Fun, where the hot dogs are famous. They're big, humongous. We've never seen a hot dog this big before. In Germany, the hot dog is little. <laughs> and in Las Vegas, it's big, it's beautiful. Big hot dog. <laughs> very big. Well, these are one half pound hot dogs. They're all, all meat, and uh, we sell about 800 a, a day. Well, one of them is usually plenty. Ben Spidell, who's vice president and general manager here, says Slots of Fun has to compete with the big places for hungry gamblers. And Slots of Fun's too small to have a big buffet. So we had uh, something different somewhere, something not found just anywhere. Where else can you get a hot dog like that for 99 cents on the strip? The biggest hot dog in the world. It's huge. I didn't start with the mustard, I don't know why. Hey, this is the best thing in Las Vegas. Well, we've been coming up here for 35 years. And we always come here to have our hot dogs. Ketchup on this side. We take a flight out of Phoenix. It takes us an hour to get up here and an hour to register. Onions on the top. Onions and sin and ketchup. And that's the first thing we head for is this, because it's a full-blown meal. It is huge. We divide it. We, we take one of these and three of us split it. The bigger, the better. They're just great. I mean, they taste good. And they're only 99 cents, too. You can't get anything better and cheaper, and I'm cheap. <laughs> just a smidgen of, of relish. Chili and cheese. Oh, super. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. Middle of the night, it doesn't matter. They get their hot dogs whenever they want. It is our lost leader. We do not make money on this hot dog. I had one last night. It didn't make me sick, so it's good. <laughs> Beautiful. You came all to Las Vegas, and the hot dog is <laughs> Some people, oh my god. Because they're so large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, if you're leaving Las Vegas and heading north, remember, a hot dog cart can be a warm and profitable place. On the first Saturday in March, a cold winter morning in Anchorage, Alaska, Michael Anderson sets up his little hot dog stand because that's the day people come to see the start of the great sled dog race called the Iditarod. Michael, who's known as M.A., sells hot dogs here on 4th Avenue every day during the summer. Uh, this is sort of an unusual gig. The Iditarod is running, the dog sleds are running. He only comes out twice in the winter time, so you've got to take advantage of it whenever he does come out. There's thousands and thousands of people in the... Uh... When it's cold, you can have a hot dog and it get warmed up. My regulars that uh, haven't seen me all winter are excited. Only in Alaska will you sell hot dogs in, what's the temperature? It's not that bad, you know. You layer up and you're moving so fast and you, you stay real close to the grill. And... It's not that bad. The street is full of teams of dogs. Their drivers are known as mushers. And the smell of onions and sausages cooking on the cart makes every creature nearby salivate. Probably 10, 20 percent of my customers are mushers or handlers. Yeah, they, uh, they appreciate a good dog. Just a minute. I did around 27, the last great race on earth, on his way to the famed Royal Arches of Nome. Five, four, three, two, one, go!
The start of the race lasts about two hours with two minutes between each of the teams. And standing there, watching the dogs take off in their protective booties, you can develop a special appreciation for Alaskan-made sausages, often with exotic ingredients. Reindeer. Genuine reindeer. And a reindeer is actually a domesticated caribou. A little spicy. They're, they're just really good, juicy. A little gamey. A little, a little more spicy. I did not think it was reindeer. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's too wild. Well, it doesn't taste like chicken. <laughs> Michael has been working this Iditarod day of winter fun since 1992. But you know, he really makes his living here on the sidewalk in the summertime. It's like a show, five days a week. You know, I do five shows a week. <laughs> it starts at 11, ends at 4. It has really, really given me uh, the opportunity to do uh, world traveling, to write my own schedule. You know, working five months out of the year, I, I just couldn't, I can't imagine a better life. I mean, it's, it's good. It's very good for me. You know, hot dogs are simple food, but they can have an amazing effect on lots of people. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the part of the city called Oakland, you'll find the original hot dog shop, sort of right in the middle of the University of Pittsburgh. Students here have lots of names for the original, but the most common is simply the O. If you want an O dog, you order it standing at the front counter. Uh, ketchup and relish on the one. And... We wait on people who we see first, but generally it's the person with the loudest mouth that gets waited on first, you know. I was next. <laughs> The O is famous for its natural casing dogs, but its french fries are extraordinary too, fried twice in peanut oil. A man named Sid Simon opened the O in 1960, and his daughter, Terry Camposano, says its success is based on fast, fresh food. You see it being made right in front of you. It's big portions and quality and fattening. And... You, you ever seen a large, extra large fry in the original? You can feed a family of six. <laughs> I just can't believe there's a bigger size of french fries than this is. But the first time I ever came here, it's like, I'm gonna get a, fr a large fry because I'm thinking McDonald's, right? Let's put it this way. If I get to order fries for myself, he can eat it with me and he can eat it with me and we're still not gonna eat it all up. So they bring this huge, huge thing of fries and I'm like, there's only me. There's just me that's gonna eat these. A large. And there's a super large. Probably it's the originals. Come on. This is the dirty O. Everybody knows this place. Oh, dirty O's. A, dirty O's a nickname. <laughs> My wife definitely called it that. The dirty O. <laughs> the original. The spot. Come down here. You meet girls when you were younger. You know. Now you bring your wife, your kids, your grandkids. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tradition, man. It's great. Probably half of it's tradition and the rest of it's, it's really good hot dogs. I don't know. I like hot dogs. We came all the way from North Carolina, actually. I love hot dogs. Mom was coming up younger in grade school. We used to smell the hot dogs. I can't tell my age, but since I was a little girl. And yep, every day, every day. Open the windows, hot dogs and french fries. We couldn't wait till lunchtime to come out here and get them. My husband, we both went to Pitt 15 years ago, so we're seeing if we still like the same things on them. And they are still as good as then, excellent. It's like the center of the universe, and everybody, everybody comes. That's another thing that's good. You can meet people from all walks of life, all religions. And when you have a place like this that everybody can come to. You can meet them, talk to them, find out different people's opinions about things. And they all get along and it works. That's like an important place to have, so. This is a good melting pot right here. And there's not a lot of places like that. I love it, as you can tell. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. <laughs> Let's face it. A hot dog will do that, make you happy. It's a food with more than just nutrition and calories. <laughs> I think hot dog is like part of the fabric of America. It really is. It's just a hot dog. You know, it's it's uh, it's American. You have your certain hot dog that you grew up with, and that's the one you love. You probably have hot dog places all over, and there's probably one special one in each town. And I think everybody has their own, and I, my mind is here. Hot dogs everywhere help define a sense of place. And all these hot dog joints give us unique, informal, classless meeting places. 
And no matter what you put on top of these sausages, they seem to satisfy something more than mere hunger. They're juicy snacks, guilty pleasures, and maybe as close as we'll ever get to a national dish. And I don't know, it's just like something that, you know, I think we all grew up with. And, uh, and they taste good. <laughs> BHT, the preservatives, can throw on the chili sauce on top of it, and you've got the king of the You had hot dogs when you were like growing up since you were little. Yeah. You I don't know if they're very nutritious, but they taste good. I don't want to know what's in them, actually. <laughs> People losing hands, feet, limbs, mother in laws, they could fall in the dark. I don't want to know. <laughs> Heads, teeth, it, nobody knows what's yeah. in there. I think it's a, it's a, mostly a, an impulse item. And, and, and also, a lot of these people are here uh, on the slide. A dog's a dog, you know I mean? Goes in one end. <laughs> I want you to eat a lot of hot dogs, OK? A hot dog program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.